Yes, so um, hello and welcome everyone to who's ever listening to this particular podcast. Today we have with us uh, Shreya Agarwal. She is a software engineer at Google working on weather and climate modeling research. using machine learning and deep learning techniques she graduated from university of waterloo with a masters of mathematics and computer science and prior to that she did her bachelor's from diisit we'll be talking more about her insights into this field of research how exactly is ai being used for climate prediction and modeling or weather prediction uh what are the open challenges and directions that we have in this domain and how she transitioned into this research role and many other topics so uh shia thanks for coming to this show it's again nice to have someone from the same alma mater and also working in the research domain over here in the states uh so thanks a lot for being here yeah thanks for having me um can you talk to us a bit about your background prior to joining google as in what was your research interest what was your majors and how did you join google in over here yeah so uh, during my undergraduate studies um i realized i was very interested in the theoretical parts of computer science um so i took a lot of electives uh, focused on um theoretical computer science eventually i was unsure if i wanted to go into the industry um and i realized if i wanted to continue doing theory probably doing research or masters is a better direction um and that's how i ended i ended up choosing uh, research in canada um which was uh, a really great experience um and it's it's over there that i realized uh, i've got this internship at google uh, which eventually converted into a full time position um but there was definitely a lot of back and forth between whether i want to continue doing research after my masters thinking about a phd going into the industry um my eventual goals uh were definitely uh, around okay i want to continue doing research uh, whether it's in the industry or academia um and so even at google i tried to kind of go towards the research side of things i see i see and what was your thought process since we are in this topic as in you said you were on the verge of deciding whether you want to do a phd or not but you were surely interested into research so what made you uh, take up a role or was it something that uh, when you joined google was it directly a research project that you were assigned and hence you decided hey i can do it over here at google why instead i should do a phd what was your thought process over that that time yeah um So luckily I got a uh, a very research oriented project uh, during my masters so typically it wasn't just you know take your courses and graduate yeah mm-hmm. it was heavily thesis focused um and that's when I got uh, a good glimpse of what a phd would be like it would just be maybe another 3 or 4 years uh, of the same thing uh more um and at google i did not get a research position to start off with which is typically the case if you're starting off as a software engineer um so after my masters what i was really sure about was um that i want to take on a project that i'm going to enjoy doing for 5 years um because it's a huge commitment when once you get into the research side of things um changing topics or if you realize you're not into the project if you're not interested in the project um then it's it's already a big commitment um and so knowing what kind of research topic i would want to do um was one of my big criteria um also having a good um, understanding of the university of the place i'm going to or about my advisor was what one of my big criteria um and that's something um i wasn't willing to compromise on uh just going into industry for a little while seemed like an easier option than deciding than committing to something i was not sure of with regards to an advisor or a research topic um yeah but within once i did join google i i started off in a complete pure software engineering role no research uh, but tried to direction myself eventually uh, by changing teams um into a more soft research oriented role i see i see yeah that's that's very interesting um uh, because i think most of the concerns for people who are interested into research but end up going into industry is the similar thing like would i be able to transition to cert- certain uh projects 
and it's it's typically very hard i mean um, i think on an average it's it's not uh, very common that you can easily transition if not it will take some long time so yeah definitely that's that's very nice to hear uh yeah. but i'm i'm yeah sorry sorry go ahead um yeah just one more thing to add i definitely spoke to a lot of people before making a decision um so i spoke to a lot of people doing research in, in the industry and also in academia and a lot of the feedback i got was um if you want there are definitely a lot of ways to move into research over the years once you in, enter the industry mm -hmm. um you don't have to come um with a phd um but it's it's your willingness and your um i guess passion for doing research that should guide you even within the industry to move into research if you don't have yeah. that it will be hard but you can all you always have that option <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, talk to me more about like what kind of projects did you work in the past? I think you have been at Google for a, quite a long time. So you start, you said you started as a uh, software engineer roles and your projects were assigned accordingly, but now you're working on climate modeling research. So can you talk to us about your current projects or also the past projects in the, in the past you worked at Google? Yeah, so my starting position, I was pretty much just doing web, web, web development. Uh, which is really anti my interest. I have uh, very little interest in web development. Um, and I realized I was also not good at it. It's, it's something you realize, okay, you can do software engineering, but not, not all kinds of software engineering. Um, so then I moved into doing uh, recommendations, ranking and recommendations for one of the teams at Google. Uh, that's where I got to pick up a lot of things uh, on machine learning. So I didn't come uh, with a machine learning background into Google, um, but doing ranking and recommendations gave me an opportunity to learn a lot of the ML frameworks, um, apply a lot of graph algorithms. Um, so a lot of the theoretical side of things uh, also interested me. Um, and from there, um, just probably my different experience, uh, different kind of backgrounds in from formal verification during my master's to, um, yeah, just learning all these different languages quickly. I guess I got lucky and into the field of doing ML for weather modeling. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. So uh, can you talk to us more about, so I, I'll, I'll be getting into the more details of how you transitioned into from software engineering to uh, weather modeling research, but uh, uh, can we can we talk more about the uh, space of research for applying machine learning and AI techniques to climate modeling? As in, we, we do understand it's, it's an active area of interest, but I think not a lot of people exactly know what's really going on from a research standpoint, exactly how do these uh, uh, AI techniques or machine learning techniques that are built for a completely different set of problem domains. Like, like originally they are just based on classification or translation from one image to another. But I think, uh, but I think the way I think most of the researchers in climate modeling are doing is much more novel, or I would say like a tweaked, uh, tweaked uh, application of it, which is very nice. So, can you talk more about like what is the problem statement that we are trying to solve using research techniques and well, what what particularly I think in one of your very nice uh, manuscripts titled "Machine Learning for Precipitation Now Casting for uh, from red, Radar Images." So I think can can you connect the dots as in what is the field about, what is the research, and what are you currently working on? Yeah, um, so the field is really around so weather modeling or climate modeling can be divided I would say into three broad subcategories. Um, so one is now casting where you're forecasting. Uh, very um, short term into the future, so a few hours ahead, maybe 12 to 24 hours ahead. Um, then there's medium range forecasting where you're forecasting three days or seven days ahead. So typically when you open Google, you're looking at weather for what's gonna happen over the weekend, a few days from now, um, you're planning some trips and things like that. So that, that is uh, medium range forecasting. Um, and then climate modeling or sub-seasonal modeling is the third category which is very far into the future. So what is going to happen one month from now or three months from now? So if you're thinking about heat waves, can we, can we predict heat waves early on? Or can we predict the onset of the monsoons in India? Um, 
all these all these things kind of fall into the sub seasonal category. Um, so you're giving an opportunity to governments, to organizations, to prepare for to prepare well in advance for what could happen in the future. Um, and machine learning um, is, I would say, a really difficult uh, weather modeling is a very difficult problem in itself, uh, just because it has a lot of physics um, involved, and it it has also. Uh, it's, it's a research area that has evolved over the past, I would say like 50 to 60 decades, uh, 50 to 60 years. So it's been around for a lot of decades now. And there's been a lot of uh, human knowledge that goes into it, a lot of uh, physics uh, equations that are involved. And machine learning, I would say is not there yet, where it can just you know, be applied as it is uh, to all these three categories and you'll get fantastic results. Um, but within machine learning, what we realized was we could start off with things like the image to image translation models. Um, so whether you can translate it into just as an image um, of pixels uh, with, let's say, of one by one kilometer resolution uh, over a spatial grid. So let's say over the US or over India, you could think of it as um, you just divide uh, the grid into uh, different regions uh, spatially. And what you're doing is you're pretty much just doing an image to image translation in the sense that you have data around what's currently the weather like, and now you're forecasting either three hours ahead or five days. Um, so you are converting current image into a future image. Um, and that's kind of what we started off with. And that's, that's kind of state of the art right now where you're mo mostly you're doing image to image kind of translation models. Um, and medium range forecasting is the hard, hard part of this, um, whether, whether we want to include physics into these machine learning models, how do we combine physics? Um, that's a huge challenge. The good thing about weather modeling is, um, there is an abundance of data. You have data all the way back from 1980. So you have like 40 to 50 years of data. Um, there's satellite imagery, there's, um, sensors on the ground, like radar sensors that you can get data from. Um, uh, and there's a lot of public data. So if anybody out there, if, if they want to get started off on these things, there's a lot of public data sets available. Um, at very, uh, a lot of them are probably at a lower resolution. That's probably what you want to start off with. Uh, but it's, it's an area that I feel anybody can get into just because of the abundance of data. Um, most other machine learning problems, a lot of the times, the issues come from not having enough data, um, which is really not a problem here. The problem here is um, understanding the data, making sense of your forecasts um, is a real challenge. So having good uh, skill in understanding what metrics you're trying to uh, optimize. Uh, when you get a forecast, how do you make sense of why your model did what it did. Because now you're going out there and convincing meteorologists that you know this machine learning model, which is pretty much a black box system, is doing something, you know, is equivalent to another model that you've developed and you've fed in um, like physics knowledge into it. Yeah. yeah. So those are some of the challenges. Yeah, yeah, this is, I, I have multiple follow-up questions. So I think starting uh, starting from as in, so, so I do, again, uh, this may might be the, limited knowledge that I have. So I work on a lot of medical images and we have these image to image translation models. But to understand more, like I think uh, in, in the past, I have seen most of the models are working not on temporal data as in like you have just one image, you are translating to some other modality or some other target image. But I think for prediction, that has to be a temporal component, so right? So I think, can, can you explain more, how does this training or uh, the architecture look like? For example, you have images of a certain location uh, for some timestamps, and then you are training a translation model to predict it for some future timestamps. Like, how does the setup work as in, what kind of models yeah. you are using and how does the training happen? Because there's a temporal component, which is again, very important for uh, climate modeling. So how does that uh, setup look like? Yeah, um, so, so the very easy way to include the temporal component is to stack these different images on, on the third, on the third uh, channel, essentially. So mm -hmm. instead of having just like one 2D image that you're feeding into the model, 
which is of the current timestamp, you're taking in uh, the same set of images from, let's say, the past one hour, uh, let's say every 10 minutes from the past hour, and just stacking them up on the third channel. So you have essentially a 3D image that you're feeding into the model. Um, a lot of the models are applying, um, so, so some of the techniques are using standard um, models that are out there, uh, like units. Units work surprisingly really well. Um, or you could include things like attention-based uh, networks into, um, into the units. Um, and your output essentially is you could, you could, your architecture could have a lot of downsampling, upsampling there. What that is essentially doing is you're, you're letting, um, so you're predicting a 2D image, you're predicting over a geospatial grid, the future. Um, and because in weather modeling, you could have storms moving from one area to another which is again the temporal aspect, right? Like when you forecast into the future, you could have a, a storm in let's say the Northeast, which moves to the Southwest. Um, and having, having like a really dense network is kind of important because for every output pixel, you want it to learn from, every, from everything else around it. So you need to provide mm -hmm. a really huge context uh, to every prediction pixel. Uh, in your output image. Yeah. Um, so having dense networks is important just because you want a really huge context for the model to learn from. Your storms, your clouds could move from anywhere to anywhere. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, th this seems very uh, intuitive and uh, interesting because I think you know, over the last uh, weekend, I was talking to a few uh, collaborators that I have from Mayo Clinic. And one interesting insight they shared is I, I, I work on a lot of T1 weighted MRI scans, right? So they, it's just a mm -hmm. 3D image, but in a, in a three dimensional structure of the brain. But now they have uh, also one other modality, which is lesser expo explored from AI perspective, which is fMRI, right? So it's a four dimensional data. It's like a 3D image collected over time stems. And the challenging part that happens in machine learning perspective is it's huge amounts of data from just one patient. And they have like, I mean, I wouldn't say thousands, but hundreds of patients from that particular organization. And the way they are uh, structuring it into the context of AI training or deep learning training is very fascinating because uh, like uh, looking at this landscape, like going from natural images to weather prediction, or for from medical standpoint to have these neural synapses being captured in MRI scans. This is again j just a comment. It's it's not a question, but it's 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 very fascinating that the same model or the same architecture can be used on so many different applications just by formulating how you how you do the setups for these experiments. So yeah, this is this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. A lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, things that I'm seeing in biology, models being developed for the medical space uh, can be kind of reused. And even, even the density of the net, uh, of the images, you know, how high, even for medical images, you want a really high resolution image. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of similar even for the weather forecast. Yeah. So there's yeah. definitely a lot of similarities. Yeah, agree, agree. And, and taking a step back to something that you said is, uh, um, said uh, the weather uh, weather modeling is not a topic that's like like in the interest in recent times. It's it has been studied for a long time. I think only the I assume the application of deep learning is maybe fairly naive. So I want to understand. So in in your brief I uh, in your brief understanding or working in this field. Uh, First of all, uh, something that I read from your paper is uh, we do have a lot of human. Uh, intervention because uh, these models are not uh, just learning from scratch you have some physics information being injected into the model that was something and, and i'll let you talk more about it but i want to learn is there any substantial work or evidence that shows that uh, using deep learning actually improves the existing uh, prediction uh, scores or like whatever the people have been using for predicting these uh, weather uh, metrics, basically, whatever whatever we are trying to optimize for. Like, I want to understand what is the interest of using AI? Like, is there substantial uh, work being done or published that says, hey, this has this can be improved or this has already improved? But again, it's a, it's a constantly evolving field for sure. So I want to learn, like, uh, do we have any, any uh, state of the art that beats human, human methods or statistical methods uh, in the previous yeah. decade? Yeah. Um, so earlier I spoke about the three different categories in weather and climate modeling. Um, what is 
but really interesting to most researchers and even the weather community, the meteorologists who've been using these physics informed models. Um, is the first category and the last category, which is the now casting space and the sub seasonal space. Um, so one, one issue that existing, the uh, physics informed uh, net numerical techniques that have you know traditionally uh, been around for decades now. Uh, the problem is they, they, they are crunching data as they get the data. And so that typically takes about six to eight hours to even get a forecast. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they're not really good at is knowing what's going to happen to us from now. Like they're unable to take the data from now and make a prediction to us from now, just because the model itself is going to be running for six hours. Um, and, and that's really where machine learning has actually, has actually shown a lot of uh, significant uh, improvement over those models. Um, just because you can have a pre-trained model that you can save, um, and now within milliseconds, you just feed in the current data to the pre-trained model, and you have an output in milliseconds. Um, mm -hmm. And so that now casting space is what's really interesting to even the meteorologists. Um, and you don't really need a lot of physics in, in that space. Um, a lot of it is just the evolution of the storm or evolution of what the current um, weather is like. Um, so there's really not much of a need to have human intervention or um, physics information uh, ingrained into the models. Um, and similarly, even for the sub subseasonal forecasting, which is let's say you're forecasting two months out, um, you don't really need, again, much physics informed models. Maybe you do, maybe when we go out and explore more, maybe informing the model of some sort of you know, physics um, laws will improve the accuracies. But for now, for now, the models are already performing really well, better than existing traditional numerical weather techniques. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so human intervention is, I would say, not really required in this now casting space and the sub seasonal space. Um, what's, what's been really hard are the metrics. How do you evaluate these models? How do you understand these models and the outputs? Because in the machine learning space, what we always like to do is just use MSE, yeah. which is like, oh, let's just optimize root mean squared error. Yeah. Um, and that's it. Like we don't really have uh, any more sophisticated metrics for you know, letting the model learn on those metrics. And what the weather community really likes to do is um, they'll be happy with if you predicted a storm, not necessarily over the same pixel, over the same region. Um, and, and that's where a lot of human intervention still exists in traditional techniques where they are, where humans will look at a forecast and be like, okay, this is fine. They're not going to do an MSE over pixel to pixel. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're, they're not gonna be doing a lot of those things. So um, maybe, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, it's still to be seen, but Human intervention, like when you just use MSE, let the model optimize MSE. Human intervention is again not needed. I see. I see. So yeah, yeah. This is again one one thing we'll dig deep into is uh, the idea of optimizing metrics and choosing which ones to write. So I, I want to learn. I think in one of the blog article related to your research uh, talks about the rain check uh, topic, right? So as in you are trying to evaluate the predictions from a model, like analyzing or interrogating what the model did uh, bad versus good or whatever predictions it did like try to explain and again I, I'm, I'm, I'm refraining to use the word interpretably like explainably and I'll, and I'll, and I'll let you uh, use those words because I don't know if that fits into the uh, domain or an umbrella of interpretability but First of all, I want to learn more about what do you interpret about the interpretability domain, as in what are we really trying to achieve when we say, I want to build interpretable AI models or explainable AI models? Uh, and what does the real world scenario look like? Because from what I understand, you're working on a problem that has real value. It's not something that we are just uh, 
creating synthetic data and trying to optimize it for uh, some challenge uh, that's hosted online. It's, it's, it's something that has a real connected uh, uh, revenue or value to it. So can you, can in, in your understanding from that particular blog post, uh, can you uh, tell us what these definitions look like? And also a bit more about what that blog, blog article, I, I think I'll be linking that article in the bottom of this video, but can you tell, tell more about what does that uh, blog mean? Yeah. Um, so specifically, um, in, in that report, we are basically trying to understand, okay, the model is making these weather predictions into the future. Uh, the difficulty again is it's not a classification problem. It's not a simple, oh, is there a cat or no cat in this image? Or is there an animal? But it's, it's a, uh, high resolution 2D prediction. So you could have multiple storms in the same prediction. Um, or you could have an abstract cloud that you're now trying to understand why did it uh, predict this cloud cover uh, over this region. Um, okay, let me take a step back. Um, so we, we want to understand, we want to explain the models, what the models are doing. We want to interpret the models. Um, uh, if I was to um, explain, explain what explainability tools are doing. Um, my first question would be whoever wants to understand the model. Um, what are you trying to understand? Who's your audience? Like, so if you're working on interpretability of an ML model, um, your first question should be, who's your audience? Who are you trying to explain your model to? Is it the user? Is it somebody who's going to take the forecast and you know, make a decision around it, whether I should take an umbrella out or not today? Are you trying to explain your forecast or your prediction of your model to a meteorologist um, who's trying to understand, you know, why did the model make a certain prediction? So there's, again, different kind of explanations going on here. Like, there's different kind of users who want to understand different things about your prediction. Um, so knowing your audience is important. And then also understanding what they want to gain out of your interpretability tools. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is there's so many interpretability tools also out there. And someone might just come around and say, oh, I want to interpret my ML model. But if you don't really know what you're going to, going to do with it, hmm. you'll be very lost in the things that you get out of these tools. You'll get like these numbers, you'll get images, you'll get attribution maps, saliency maps, but you'll really not know what to do with it. So having a clear understanding of what you want to achieve in, in the end, are you trying to optimize? Are you trying to optimize your model? Are you trying to design your model in a different way? Are you trying to understand what were the mispredictions of your model? Like, what? Why is your model mispredicting? Hmm. Um, a lot of those things again fall into the category of ex interpretability or explainability, um, and interpretability to achieve a certain goal um, is how I would explain this. Um, and so in, in that blog post, what we were specifically trying to do is um, basically we have this 2D prediction of whether it's going to rain or not over a geographical area. How do we allow the meteorologists to understand these predictions? How do we even categorize these? How, how do we chunk these predictions down to smaller pieces? So you could, let's say, have multiple storms in the same prediction. How do you pick? two different storms and explain these two different storms separately. Um, so weather space is again very difficult in that sense. You probably don't have just like one cat or two cats that have mm -hmm. a well-defined cat shape, but you have like multiple storms that have weird, weird shapes. Um, and how do you explain these different predictions differently uh, was what we were trying to understand in that blog post. Yeah. Mm. Um, one more thing to add. So we were also very focused on how do we categorize mispredictions? How do we fix mispredictions? Mm. Um, yeah. I see. I see. And and one of the uh, 
things that you did mention that has my own curiosity is the idea of uh, injecting these models with a so substantial amount of uh, physics knowledge. So I'm, I'm curious, mm -hmm. this is if you can shed some light is how do we exactly do that? For example, in the past, I have only worked with uh, models that can learn from scratch or it can learn from some pre-trained models, right? Like we have some initialized weights that is trained on some uh, public corpus of data sets. Uh, how do we, what do we exactly mean when we say, uh, we want to inject some amount of physics knowledge into these models for doing these classifications. Is it the same as pre-training and uh, fine-tuning or something? So is there something else uh, going on over there? Um, yeah, so I would say it's a little different than pre-training. Um, basically, what we could be trying to do is, let's say, when we say we want to inform the model of some physics is uh, one, one really naive way that a lot of people have experimented with is um, uh, basically things like, let's say we want to con uh, let the model conserve energy in the system. And so now you specify your loss function so that your, your loss function is uh, uh, essentially limited. It's conserving the energy. It's making sure that energy is conserved. Um, so you could, you could specify your loss function according to these laws. So that is one way. Um, yeah, another another could probably be in a lot of the pre-processing steps of what kind of data you feed into the model. Um, and so probably if if you're if you uh, instead of letting the model learn physics that it may not be able to, um, you pre-process the data, extract some information out of it based on some physics laws, and then feed that into the model. Um, so so doing some pre-processing steps. Uh, but it's still an active area of research. There's no good answers, I would say, at this point. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. And and uh, you you also did say this is a very fairly naive field. So I want to learn in a much more concrete sense. What are the open challenges that most of the research are, researchers are like focused on right now? For example, I can quickly say about few topics for uh, let's say the standard computer vision or uh, because since we are talking about computer vision, but for example, even language models have or let's say uh, medical imaging has like for example generalizability or uh, find uh, transfer learning based on new data sets that the model has not seen. But I think uh, for climate forecasting, it could be something very different because it has in, its, its own limitations and its own challenges. So can you talk to us more about it concisely, like what are the specific uh, topics or uh, very subdomains that are active interests that remain still as open challenges and most of the teams or big groups are focusing on? Yeah, uh, so the biggest one is, again, how do we push uh, the forecasting range? from now casting, from short-term forecasting to more medium-term medium, medium -term forecasting, so a few days into the future. Um, that is, I would say, a huge open challenge that everyone is trying to solve. How, how can we even predict one day into the future? Yeah. And at a fairly high resolution, because one easy way is to, you know, you just lower the resolution. Um, instead of predicting at the one by one kilometer resolution, you predict at 100 by 100 kilometer resolution. Uh, but you know, keeping that high resolution, how do you move into the into this medium range forecasting? Um, a lot of companies, a lot of different organizations out there are going for it. Um, if it does happen, it will it will be really amazing, but it's still to be seen whether we can go into that space. Um, then another another one is again predicting extreme events. How do we um, you know, with climate change, you have more and more extreme events. Um, can you predict them far ahead? Um, enough that, you know, you again, let everybody uh, prepare for those events. So already this year, uh, in 2021, we saw a lot of extreme events hit the US. There were heat waves, there were uh, hurricanes. And if we know precise location of where, you know, those storms are going to hit on the ground or the timing, you kind of let you let the organizations again prepare for these things well in advance. Um, so a lot of those, you know, with with the climate changing, a lot of those are again open challenges that everyone is going for. 
I see. I see. And one interesting thing that we mentioned, like I think we had an exchange a few days back and you said uh, about the uh, underestimation versus overestimation of these techniques, right? Like people still think that AI is the magic tool or panacea for anything that can solve anything and everything that it has. And you just throw data and it gives you the predictions that you want, which is something what the media articles always tend to hype about it versus when we actually work on these things, like it's it's a very unstable um paradigm right like we are training uh tra like the deep learning model has to have very curated data sets like you said it has to be it, it cannot see garbage and it can uh predict very good results and versus even the training for example I'm, I'm sure you must be aware about the gans and lots of other techniques which are yeah. getting very very uh sophisticated but they are very very hard to train as in like it can it can it can be very unstable to give very uh nonsensical uh predictions so there's there's definitely these two sides, right? Like overestimation and underestimation. But specific to weather modeling forecast, what do you see as in what is something that people should not expect? As in like, okay, this is not going to be done. Okay, we can improve things to a certain extent. We can automate things uh, in a much sense. But this is something that, that remains a very big question for even yeah. um, uh, weather modeling research using machine learning. Yeah. Um, so... so Yes, um, ML hype, uh, whether it works or whether or not, is yet to be seen. Um, and one of the really big challenges about this space is, um, so you have computer scientists on one end, people who know only machine learning, um, you know, pure machine learning, and, and they, they, are in, they believe that, okay, pure machine learning can solve all the problems. Um, and then you have the physics um, side of the thing, the physicists, the meteorologists, who believe uh, that you know you, it's it's a black box system. You can't just like feed in random data into a black box system and expect good results. Um, they really want more, uh, you know, rigor into these things. Uh, and the trouble is, in in our education system, we don't have these two things combined. Like, not everybody learns. No, Computer scientists don't learn about the physics, and the meteorologists don't learn computer science. Um, and so now you have these two different worlds uh, trying to get into each other's space, but not having full education or knowledge about the other space. Um, and so, so that's a that's what we're working with. Basically, com machine learning uh, researchers who do not have much knowledge of the physics. Um, and so there's always this hype around, okay, whether machine learning, pure machine learning can solve these problems. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong or not work very well when you have pure machine learning models. Um, your model could be underestimating a lot of the fault storms. Um, and models, again, like things like GANs, whether they... So we had a paper from DeepMind that used scans, um, but again, whether they can really work well when you go into the medium range forecasting um, is is yet to be seen. Um, and so, at least I'm in the camp right now where I don't think pure machine learning can solve all of weather. Where whether I don't think we can replace the traditional physics-based techniques completely. Mm -hmm. uh, I think eventually we'll be at a space where we have hybrid models, where we are, um, yeah, com combining the two worlds into one space and learning from each other instead of having pure machine learning models just replace everything. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, hmm. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that I think I think uh, for for one insight that I can share is uh, the, the, a similar insight that I have when I'm working with neurologists, right? Like we are trying to detect, uh, for example, one of the projects that I'm working is for migraine detection. So a lot of people suffer from migraines and post traumatic headache from accidents or military circumstances, and uh, people know that they are suffering from migraine. They know the clinical onsets like if you have headaches more than certain amount of days then you classify as a migraine but one of the key insights that still remain is doctors or neurologists don't know uh, what actually happens in your brain like what is exactly going on for alzheimer's for dementia for parkinson's we do have certain amount of medical proof that sh shows like okay this is exactly like this brain regions are deteriorating and hence you're feeling these things and one of the key insights when i'm working on these with uh 
Nirola, this is something that you said we are not trying to replace because, of course, medical medical uh, knowledge beats any um, algorithm that can just crunch some numbers. But one of the things that they are interested into getting into deep learning is some kind of discovery, as in if you can point us to certain locations where exactly the model can look at, then we can apply these uh, medical insights that, hey, it's a, it's a huge brain. There are, I think, I don't know, 300 and, 374 uh, regions. It's like too much to even process Like when I'm working with these regions. And if, if at all these models can point out, oh, these are the top 30 that I have the highest confidence for, then at least they do feel certain kind of relief. Oh, yeah, that makes sense because it's known that because migraine has something related to visual cortex and something, and hence uh, they can. So I think that's how, I'm, I'm not sure about the climate modeling research, but I think this is how I have seen in my experience these two different, very, very different domains that don't understand each other's concepts or the background, but they are just trying to mutually benefit from each other. And again, deep learning is always hungry for data. So when, whenever we get more data sets, we are happy to work on these. So yeah, I, I assume it, it must be similar like uh, for climate modeling, it could lead to some discoveries that was never seen by humans because we are not good at uh, crunching so much data, but something something of a patent recognition. Yeah, in fact, I would say that's that's precisely it. Like that's um, like I think it's the same parallel for even the weather space, where meteorologists are not necessarily looking for you know machine learning to replace their models, but trying to see can we build more scientific understanding of how the weather is behaving from these models. Maybe machine learning is just because it's able to crunch so much data very well. Maybe it's picking up on some sort of um, phenomena that humans already don't know about. And in fact, that's where even the interpretability or explainability will come in handy. Uh, because when we do get the predictions, we need, we need to understand what the machine learning model was learning or picking up on. Hmm. Um, and having good explainability or interpretability tools for these weather models will actually let you understand if it was able to pick up on new scientific understanding that we can then inform the meteorologists about leading to even better models. Um, mm. Yeah, so there's all these connections in all these different domains. And, and, and I'm also wondering uh, if, if you are aware about the whole uh, argument of is explainability really required versus some people definitely say, for example, in, in even your domain, it's something that can aid uh, or at least developers, for example, you can get some feedback from your models that, hey, what are the misclassifications looking like? Is there something wrong that I'm doing with the objective functions I'm trying to optimize for? But there's also a debate. A lot of people also say a hey, explainability is something of a move point. Like it, it's like something we are just uh, hitting in a in a circle. It's not really required. Do you, do you have any insights uh, into this domain, do you believe uh, explainability is something very critical versus, okay, it can add some benefit versus uh, something, oh, it's it's not really of a uh, important thing. If, if there are these three categories, how would you place this, uh, this subfield? Yeah, I, I would say it's a first. I think it's very critical. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, initially, you know, you might see a lot of papers out there saying, okay, our weather models, uh, our machine learning weather models are, doing better than XYZ models. Uh, but eventually you'll have to understand what these models are doing. Um, because you want to replicate these systems and, and, and you want these systems to work for the next, let's say, 20 years. Um, and you want to, again, convince the meteorologists of these models. So I think explainability, it's not just about even improving your current model or um, like th that is one of the aspects that, okay, it, it may let you improve your existing machine learning model for sure. Uh, but I think having a good insight into what the model is doing is, mm. is really critical to building trust in users in whoever you're serving your predictions to or meteorologists. Um, mm. And yeah, it's, it's not just for the computer scientist. It's, I would say again, your audience is huge. And it's critical for everybody to know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. And I think um, even one of the other aspects that people most often to forget is the idea that uh, we, are, we are working on 
for problems that are like let's say just for the sake of research made for example synthetic images synthetic data sets it could be easily argued that because this is a highly curated uh, problem domain you can focus strictly on op uh, optimizing certain metrics or benchmarks but i think when we are working with i think real real world challenges again real world seems very big word but as in like something that has some real value as associated to it having certain kind of uh investigation techniques really help even first of all i mean uh, I, uh, as of the, as of the first point i don't really care about the user domain but even from a developer's perspective right like if i trained a model that was off from someone's research how do i make sure that this works because at the end these are just numbers so for publishing those results i need to be sure that this is not just uh, a, a, a random correlation that really happened because the data set was nice uh, but yeah yeah I, i definitely agree it has it, it has to have some some real substantial value over the next few years yeah and yeah um uh, i i just wanted to come back to one of the other bookmarks that we had uh, earlier and coming uh, coming a step back from your research as you said something about transitioning from your software engineering role to research scientist right uh, uh, to to, to uh, i would say research roles now so how did you particularly have this transition as in uh Uh, what does the transition look like for example if you are a software engineer working as a researcher versus some someone who is who is technically kind of a research scientist at google what are the differences as in uh, was it something uh, that you transitioned from being uh, working on infrastructure data analysis and something and now you are because you have the whole ownership of a project and you transition to a research role or is it something else and this is again a student friendly question because not a lot of people understand what is the difference between being a researcher research scientist um, uh, or maybe a software engineer who works on research problems so how does this uh, fit into the equation yeah um so at least at google i'm i'm not sure i can speak the same for other companies but at least at google i would say the the line between research scientist and software engineering is quite blurred uh mm. every researcher needs to develop code um it doesn't have to be production level quality it doesn't have to go into a direct product that that will be somebody else's responsibility but you need to write code at the end mm. of it um it's not just about you know writing um a google document or a paper on concepts and letting somebody else implement but you'll have to prove things um through actually implementing them um and as a software engineer if you're in the research space uh you will you 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 should have the curiosity uh to develop new things this and and, and the understanding that you're potentially going to fail so whether you are implementing your own research ideas or somebody else's research ideas um it has to be at least in the research space quick because you want to understand your failure failures quickly whether it's going to work or not um it's you're not necessarily developing production level code base um even as a software engineer in the research space um so you have to implement your ideas quickly test them out quickly and um be okay with feeling in the space as most researchers are like if you're a researcher you're you know you're going to fail on your ideas a lot of times and maybe succeed once mm -hmm. um and so even as a software engineer you're probably going to fail a lot on these research ideas um and so for me um uh the way i got into the space was i looked for a project that was very new that was still growing so we were only a literally i was the third person to join the team um and so when you're in such a new domain and in a, in such a small team um it gets very blurred whether uh there's no way you're only going to be just implementing infrastructure you, you'll have to be the one working on the ideas you'll have to be the one coming up with new ideas new research ideas experimentation and all of that um maybe if you if you join in a 20 person come in a 20 person company or team where you know there's already enough people who've been allocated to different parts maybe they you'll get stuck in a more of a software engineering role uh, but just because i happened to join a team that was still growing i i was involved right in the beginning from all aspects from uh how are you going to clean up your data storing your data um methods for what kind of models do you want to develop on experimentation 
and working on pretty much all of my own ideas. So it, it wasn't even the case that, you know, somebody would give me their ideas and I would work on it. Um, I, mm. I had complete ownership right from the beginning. Um, so it was, uh, it was really interesting because I could now leverage my strengths in software engineering combined with all of my curiosity and excitement to do research um, into this domain. Um, so I would say it's not necessary, you know, that you have to pursue a research scientist ladder or software engineering grad ladder um, to do that. You could be in some other space, but as long as you have the curiosity and, you know, uh, interest in learning new things or applying your ideas, um, I think you'll be fine. I guess I was also lucky to get a very supportive team who would let me experiment with their ideas. Right, right, and and how do you how did you go about building this skill set? Because you said when you joined Google, it was uh, machine learning was not something as, as your forte, right? Like it was not something that you clearly had a, a particular very tailored portfolio, but you built on these skills uh, as as long as these uh, challenges that you came across. So how did what really worked? For example, a lot of people have these uh, graduate level courses that really help them understand the basics, right? Like because the the beautiful thing or maybe the bad thing about uh, working with deep learning is you have to have a very strong set of mathematical uh, knowledge what exactly you are trying to do and then again comes the programming because ultimately you you have to have a model that really works well with cpus gpus and everything that goes on the implementation level so what what was something that you would uh, assign your uh, uh, skill set to as in what how how did you go about building these skill sets and what were the road or milestones that you would say researchers should hit if they if they want to be really good at uh, implementing and working with these deep learning models yeah so i would say i learned pretty much on the job all of my skill sets and reading a lot um so i also realized a lot of courses you know you again work with like synthetic data you'll have um your own architectures or you'll have you know you'll just be like going through the mathematical concepts but until you actually hit the roadblocks and go out to explore, you know, how do I, how do I resolve these things? You'll actually not uh, grasp the intuition of things. So mm -hmm. um, I think taking up a new problem that has not been explored before um, really helped me understand machine learning, um, what it's doing, what it's not doing, all, all the different aspects of it, the ma mathematical uh, backgrounds associated. Um, so I would say for anybody who's out there, you know, who's who's doing courses, who's just who, who's trying to pick up on this, I would say take up a challenging problem and start from the beginning. Um, start from the very beginning. Start with your data. Um, start with a very simple machine learning model. Um, try and understand what the model is doing. Look at your metrics. Um, uh, because if you just follow like a tutorial, if you just follow notebooks, if you just follow courses, you'll actually not build the intuition for a lot of these things. Um, mm. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it's good or bad that I didn't formally have these courses that I went through. Um, but I, I picked up the intuition literally on the job, just, just doing the work I was doing, um, failing a lot, getting stuck reading papers yeah 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 it, it's um uh, uh it's 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 really nice to hear this because it's it's something i've heard a lot but again uh, now that i'm working on a different like having a different perspective onto this advice really helps me resonate on this advice a lot because um i have learned a lot uh from working on unknown data sets unknown metrics we are not sure what we are trying to look at and and hence when when i'm looking at these deep learning models like training the model and running the model is the least amount of work i do like it's always the other things that really happens before after that happens so, like this was this was my naive understanding and i've also said in the past podcasts like i this was my naive understanding that okay i'm doing a phd in computer science i have to be really my like my 80 percent of my time would be in trading models and testing models and implementing models and doing really good but i think it's less than five percent like it's it's really what happens before after uh, selecting data what to work with and what not to 
reading the literature, even if it's not computer science. And and I think having this advice that you said, right, that uh, uh, working on a problem that you don't have a clear understanding really helps you understand deep learning better. Because if we are just using Kaggle data sets or something that's already out there and people have worked on, it does not help us explore the very subtle details that goes on to uh, uh, into deep learning. And again, I don't think anybody gets the whole idea of deep learning in, in their very long research level because there are so many facets to it. It's it's really hard to keep up with uh, what to work on. So I, I, yeah, just looking at this advice in a different angle makes me, makes me uh, yeah, <laughs> happy and also curious about this advice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I would say 5%, only 5% or maybe 10% of my time is actually spent on the model on the machine learning yeah. model and yeah. like 90 percent is just breaking my head over everything else around it yeah yeah, yeah. And and I'm curious. So from uh, because I I understand you are a fairly much more on the research side now. So is there something again? This could be apart from uh, your current mainstream of research, which is whether modeling and uh, uh, re, uh, prediction research. But are you something? Uh, do you have some some uh, techniques that you follow a lot in the recent few years that you feel really passionate about for deep learning? For example, even if it's not related to your active area of research, but you still follow that research because you find it interesting like what's what's on your nightstand for i mean it's it's a very bad word like people like to ask what's on your nightstand to read books but like what's on your nightstand for research as in like what is something that you low-key follow even if it's not directly useful for your research what's what's uh what's intriguing to you from a deep learning domain yeah i think uh i i really enjoy reading all the research that's recently coming out on the weather and climate modeling space itself like just because it's still a very new domain um, hmm. trying to understand, you know, what different people were applying and then, you know, next day waking up and going like, okay, I want to apply the same thing, hmm. um, hmm. is very exciting. And a lot of times, you know, there'll be a lot of stuff not useful coming out of it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sometimes like, okay, you know, there's a lot of these papers I want to read and then I'll be like, okay, I'll just like go through them in 30 minutes and be like, okay, this is not something I can apply. Uh, but most of the times I'm looking for new ideas, papers that are coming out with, and any new idea that I could directly apply. Yeah, hmm. so in research also I've realized if I read research that I cannot directly apply, I'll read it and forget about it in a few days or you know, I'll just know, never go back to it. Um, hmm. But it's really exciting to read things that I can go ahead and directly apply to my models. I see, I see, I see. And uh, do you have any tips for, because uh, I, I, I normally keep this question to the last is, most of the people listening to this are like normally researchers or uh, graduate mm -hmm. students who are trying, who have a subtle hint of interest for research. Do you have any tips for those people? Because uh, a lot of people, like like we already discussed, it's a, it's a plethora of topics to cover. So it's it's very hard to get started, right? Like the first step is the hardest one. Where do we start? Do I take, uh, do I do a graduate level course that can help me into research, learn more about the very fundamentals versus something like you said, right? Like you learned on the go. You you learned when you you were working on these problems on the job. Um, so it's it's always there are multiple approaches to uh, getting or getting a mastery or um, like su sufficient amount of expertise into these domains. How would you go about advising anyone who is interested, let's say in weather modeling, how does that person start into this domain? Yeah. Um... So I would say, uh, and probably not just for weather, uh, weather modeling, probably exists for any, anybody. I would say um, get a really, um, so think, think of a really small prediction problem that you want to solve. Uh, and it could be anything in your day-to-day -day life. Um, uh, like maybe it's like, okay, you, you're saying it's a sunny day out there today and you want to know whether it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Um, uh, and it's a really, it's a really simple problem, you know, just predict whether it's going to be sunny tomorrow, what is going to be the temperature for tomorrow. Um, and pick a data set, maybe either, so again, weather data set, just because it's so abundant, it's really easy to start off mm -hmm. on this. Um, find out, like, you can email me if you want to know about data sets, but find a data set that exists. And this is for any machine learning research. If you're going to start off on uh, a problem for which you may have, for the, 
where there's lack of data, um, it's going to be hard to debug because you're going to probably fail very soon. Your model is going to overfit and you'll fail probably really soon and give up. Um, so find a problem that has abundant data. Um, pick, pick like a really you know, small feature set that you're going to begin with and just open, open your Google Colab or anything and literally just like uh, start following the steps for training a really small and simple model. Um, I would say, you know, forget about all of your Kaggle data sets or tutorials or maybe graduate level courses. Like those, those things will take months. Um, mm -hmm. if, you want, if you want to know whether you're going to enjoy this, how do I even get started? Like start off really small, start off on a really small data set and just like create a really simple model. A hundred, hundred lines of code is essentially what you should be starting off with. Um, to give you that confidence in things um, and, and to see results immediately, to see your prediction results, because it's only when you see results that it's going to give you the confidence to keep going. Um, and I guess like the other big tip would be uh, you, you should be ready to fail. Like yeah. your, your model is not going to work well in your first try. Like it's for sure not going to work well. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's where the interesting part starts. Now, how do you debug things? Um, so you should be ready to fail in your first try. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree to that. And I think um, now that I'm sufficiently reading a lot of stuff from research, I can barely say that, I mean, most of the like 80 percent of the papers that are published are something talking about what are their experiments right like nobody claims oh we did it uh we did it something that what we wanted to do so i think most of the research is something okay maybe ma taking baby steps into this direction you never say that oh this was my goal and i achieved it in one one go and this is what my published results are maybe once in a lifetime we get papers like that but i think most of the most of the papers in research even like they are just pushing bounds just a little bit at a time and i think it's it's okay it's okay. I think even even most of some very nice papers also talk about what didn't work for them. So I think uh, talk, like even failures are something that some uh, in research is very well recognized because it gives the other direction what not to do for sure. So yeah, yeah, I I completely agree to that one too. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's all I had for you. So I think yeah, we we a lot of topics and the nice things that I like about these uh, podcasts is something. Uh, learning new as in like this weather modeling research it's, it's an active area people like to talk about hey how deep learning can really help in uh, the overall light climate change global warming and things but taking baby steps like okay at least when, let's take realistic steps of weather prediction one at a time like let's use it like the stages and that's what really excites me in a very naive baby like sense that um Yes, these techniques, even though they seem very dumb enough, they have some very nice potentials when we have some uh, nice way of training data set tips and data sets that we use. So it's it, it was really fun. I think we, we covered a lot of topics and even researching for this podcast really gave me very nice insights into this field, something that even I would like to explore if I get some time off my uh, calendar. But this is something very in interesting. And I think people who are listening should be surely uh, intrigued because not a lot of not a lot of resources are, are out there who actually talk about apart from research papers not a lot of people have given uh, insights how this actually works so thanks thanks a lot for sharing these insights especially coming from a researcher from google who has like at least at least the works done by google research is something of a of a of a benchmark so definitely thanks thanks a lot and i'll i'll leave the links and the things that were discussed in this uh, description so that people can directly check out i'll leave a link to your profile so that people can hit you up uh hopefully not uh, annoy but uh if they have any questions they can directly ask uh to you but apart from that thanks thanks a lot for being here yeah i really enjoyed yeah. coming uh yeah talking to you about everything i'm doing and it's it's really exciting to me and so i i hope that came across